thanks time for the uh, introduction. Um, yes, so as you've heard, uh, I am at Curtin University working at the Curtin Institute for Computation and um, I am overseeing the ADEX uh, work we're doing from Curtin. Um, I hope you all can see my slides and that things will move forward when I click my buttons. <laughs> Okay, so a quick introduction to who ADEX are. Um, so our vision is to pro provide astronomy focused training, support and expertise to allow astronomers to maximize the scientific return from data and computing infrastructure. And um, we commenced operations in March 2017. This was after um, institutions from around the country could apply to actually run this initiative. Um, we now have two nodes, Swinburne University and Curtin University, and we're funded by um, Astronomy Australia Limited through the uh, National Collaborative Research Infrastructure, NCRIS. Uh, if you want to have a look at our webpage, feel free. And with the work that we're doing, we have basically three service components that we are looking after. Um, there's the training. Uh, we do face-to-face -face training, webinars, internships, a lot of different kind of training. Um, the face-to-face -face can be single or multi-day workshops. Uh, the webinars or pre-recorded tutorials are also available on our webpage. And um, we're also running internships uh, out of the Swinburne node that are uh, there to support um, a lot of PhD students in this case uh, to actually learn about software development and, and work in a software dev team. Um, our second service component is computing and data services. Uh, so there we support, we do software support on the OSTAR supercomputer also at the Swinburne node and uh, data management and collaboration platform is also run from that node. And then our um, third service component is national support where we do spend a lot of time on as well. And there we have professional software support, so um, researchers can apply for time and we uh, match them up with a software developer to work through their project and give them back a prototype um, at the end. And uh, there's also the Astronomy Supercomputing Time Allocation Committee. So as part of ADEX, we have a specific number of CPU hours that can be applied for and uh, we got a time allocation committee for that. So to look more in detail at the training that we're doing. Um, so the training we provide, we aim to de teach basic computational skills and best practices. Um, personally, I do believe that as researchers, you do not have to be software developers but you still need the, the basics right to make sure that your analysis works properly, but also to then be able to talk to the software developers, for example, that we have in our team to, to enable better work there. Um, we are aiming to cater for different skill levels and we're currently at the time where we are going more into the um, intermediate and advanced training. Um, we want to offer content and new computational advances, advances that could prove really useful in the future, either for astronomy itself or just for um, data analysis in general, because the fact is a lot of PhD students don't stay in astronomy, they go out into industry or other fields. So for example, um, we, we've run quite a few machine learning workshops over the years as well, um, with a focus on astronomy. To, to talk with people about how they potentially could apply something like this. And uh, we also would like to prepare researchers for alternative career paths um, within astronomy or the technical industry. So that's why we have the internships, for example. Now, when we started out, the, the main question was like, what, what should we teach? So the first thing we did in 2017 was put together um, a community survey which had a range of multiple choice questions to just gauge what software are researchers using at the moment and what are the training requirements coming out of that. So in, in the last 10 years or so, Python has become really popular with astronomy. Before that, you would have had a lot of people um, using IDL or Fortran or something like that. So um, 
the, the question there was, have we, have we really bridged the gap yet? How much basic training do we still need in that um, area? So you can see from the, um, from the graphs at the bottom that uh, the majority of people are using Python. It's about 86% or so. Um, we also have a fraction of people there that are using R. I was one of them, so I didn't really start learn, uh, using Python much until after I finished my PhD. Um, but you can see there as well that there's a lot of people still using IDL. Um, and one of the, the problems in the way of IDL as well is that you need your licenses and institutes often have very limited number of licenses and you end up in fights about who can do their analysis and who can't. So getting them onto open source software was something that was uh, important to us. Um, you can see as well there from the requested training that most people uh, really wanted to learn more about Python and machine learning, which was up and coming in 2017 as well. And then uh, how to do scientific visualization. I mean, we all need to present our data somehow, but um, often we do end up probably choosing um, the worst possible graphs to show the data. And then um, with the new influx of big data that we have coming in with new telescopes like the square kilometer array, we really need to learn how to migrate things onto high performance computing, how to make our code more efficient and also um, go into GPU coding where it makes sense. So these are also quite popular um, requests we had in that original community uh, survey. So based on that, we then actually put together um, quite a lot of workshops. Uh, we repurpose material where possible. So we heavily uh, leaned on Carpentry's material, both for um, content, but also for um, the teaching. So I myself am a Carpentry's uh, instructor. Um, so that was quite helpful to, to know how to put the, the how to know to put the material together and to teach it. Um, so the collection you can see here as well, uh, the 23 things, I don't know how many of you can remember it. I repurposed that for uh, 10 astronomy things to make that available to just talk about data management because uh, as I said, with all the big data we have coming in, we really have to think about this much more in detail. Um, we have the, uh, the ASVOs, that's the Australian Virtual Sky, observatory um, and they do a lot of that data management for us now um, but there's still a lot of training out there that people would need on how to use those observatories properly how to get the data they're actually interested in um, the main languages we told was python and version control and i honestly was surprised by how many astronomers didn't have version control background when i started my training <laughs> So I think at least in that sense, uh, we have helped the community to actually um, yeah, put things under version control. And then um, we did a lot of training as well around HPC. So we used to have POSI as one of our um, partners as well, who helped a lot with um, the HPC training and getting things onto like their cloud, for example, as well. Um, otherwise we are, uh, we have done a little bit of R and SQL training and we have um, information on our website on HDF5 and um, specific astronomy packages in Python. This one is called AstroPy, this little um, snake you can see there. Um, but the, the issue in a way is a lot of this is still very focused on introductory material and we've been thinking about for a while how can we actually get more into the intermediate and advanced space. Um, so training delivery also we have tried to span as many um, possible uh, pathways as possible. So we got our face-to-face -face workshops um, obviously in the this year there haven't been that many. We managed to squeeze one in just before everything locked down. Um, we also got a LMS uh, that is now quite easily accessible on our webpage where we have um, video tutorials and we're working through a lot of that to um, also give uh, Jupyter Notebooks along with that so people can actually work through things. 
a lot of the video tutorials in our LMS are also on our YouTube channel. Um, all the materials from our workshops are on our GitHub page. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we run internships as well at the um, Swinburne Node. And uh, we also try to put together uh, online resources from other places that might be useful for um, astronomers. Uh, so a lot of the online resources at the moment is a work in progress, but in the end, I want to make this kind of like a little one-stop shop. Um, so our face-to-face -face training is really where I put a lot of my time in. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we adopt the carpentry style code along setup, which has been quite uh, popular and successful. We uh, run single multi-day workshops. And I think most importantly, we really work together with the astronomy community uh, by working with the uh, Astronomical Society of Australia through their theoretical chapter, ANITA, and the Hollywood School, which is run by students for students. Back when I went to the Hollywood School, it was mostly talks. And for years, people have said we would like more hands-on um, parts. So it's really good that for the last three years or so, we've gone along as ADEX and have taught some introductory computing. And we've also worked with some of the centers of excellence like Astro 3D or OSGREF. Um, and this year we had our first Hack Week. So that was the last face-to-face -face training we had. And the Hack Weeks are really interesting. They're kind of a mix between a summer school and a busy week, but they're very um, participant-led. And it was important for me that people come along bring their own hack project that they can then actually use the skills they learn into tutorials and apply them to their project while still having people around that can help along when they need it. Um, yeah, this is uh, just to show that the material we have, we have been working on making that easier to access as well. So if you go to our webpage, you can actually see um, a summary of all the workshops that we've run and all the different kind of topics that they had. Um, the LMS, you can join the courses. It used to be behind another login. Now it's right in front. So it's quite easy for people to go and, and look at things. YouTube channel for those who prefer watching things on YouTube. As I said, everything is on GitHub. We have a few success stories from recent internships on there as well and our online resources page is a work in progress but the idea really there is to make it a one-stop shop for um, PhD students but also researchers to just come and, and start looking into okay how do I actually learn what I want. Um, so the, the question for us right now is where to from here so how can we ensure the training stays relevant and how can we provide this intermediate and advanced training? So one of the things we started doing is uh, collect skill profiles to figure out what people at different levels actually know in terms of computing. And then from there map the learner journeys so we can identify the obvious gaps in the training material that's out there and hopefully fill those gaps. And then offer easy pathways to follow to upskill to those steps. So on our webpage right now, um, for some of the core skills, we, we are giving a little bit of information on what beginner, intermediate, advanced might look like. And we also got a couple of astronomer profiles together in terms of as a, as a, cosmologist, a cosmologist, this is uh, the typical skills you might need. So if you come in as a new PhD student or so, you can be like, oh, okay, I need those things so I can start learning Python and I can start learning these packages. And the next uh, thing we're doing right now, so we have a merit allocation program that until now was for software support, but we found even with software support applications that we received previously that um, people would want some, some training or they, re they requested software support where it's like, well, it's better if you actually train on how to do it yourself than write those pieces of code for you. So we, um, we have worked on uh, adapting our merit allocation process to also include people being able to apply for training. So um, this helps us understand what the training needs of the community are and uh, you might find more interesting uh, areas that are interested this way than if you send out another community survey. Um, and it allows the community re to request that bespoke training that they need 
for, for, for advancing their own research. So what can people um, apply for? They can apply for workshops, either to rerun stuff we've done before or to request a new one. Um, current way, they can either be face-to-face -face or live streamed. They can request um, online resources, so new self-paced tutorials or webinars to be created. And they can also request training as part of an extra software support project. So as I said, at the end of a project, we usually hand the code over to the researchers and from there they on their own. So here we made it possible to say, okay, don't just give us the code, put some extra time in um, to show us how to use it and how we can maintain it in the future ourselves. Um, so we currently finish the EOI process for the next semester, which is the 2021 um, semester. And we had three training applications and we also had several software support um, projects that would like more training at the end. So hopefully we see what our um, time allocation committee is deciding, but hopefully we get all of these through and it's gonna be very interesting to see how this continues in the future. So with that, uh, thank you. And uh, we can have Thanks. a look for the 